Well, let me start by saying that um, Hungarians, in my view, regret uh, the departure of the UK. Um, I think we all remember that in the 1990s, the UK was one of the strong supporters of the enlargement of uh, the European Union. And um, they played a strong role, whether it was conservative or Labour government, but they, they, they were promoters of um, the Eastern enlargement. And, um, and we all would have wished uh, the UK to stay. The Hungarian Prime Minister even published a paid um, uh, advert in one of the newspapers last year before uh, the referendum um, asking them to uh, stay. Of course the vote did not turn out that way, but I think for us there is clarity about the need to continue the European Union as uh, a, a strong community and um, and also enlarge it further if possible. Okay. We are very close to the Balkans, including the Western Balkans. We believe that the enlargement has a, a capacity to help reforming and transforming countries which aspire for EU membership. Mm -hmm. So we believe that uh, even if the composition of the European Union will change as a result. One high income country leaving, potentially lower income countries waiting for accession. Mm. Uh, but this needs to be taken very seriously that this is an unfinished project mm. in the Balkans. There is a real scare, uh, and I tell you why. Because um, there is a scenario number three, mm. which um, is phrased in a way uh, to allow countries that want to form groups to deepen integration, uh, to allow them, and not everybody being obliged to participate in any type of mm. uh, cooperation in the European Union. And you can have a kind of overlapping groups mm. uh, to integrate in this area or that area. However, there is only one reading in the East, maybe not only in Hungary but also in Poland, that this is a project for the two-speed Europe. Mm. This is a project to separate some countries from the core of uh, the European Union and this is not something people would like. From the very start, um, you know, we experienced so-called transition periods on some issues. For example, on the free movement of workers, there were transitional arrangements. And then the Eastern countries, the new member states, were always in favor of phasing out these transitional arrangements as soon as possible, because, so, so to speak, we don't want to be second class members, right? There should be no first class or second class uh, membership. I know that this scenario number three is not entirely speaking about first class mm -hmm. or second class, but, um, but there is um, this type of reading which uh, scares some people and um, I think we need, we need to clarify whether this is a favoured option or not for many other people. If not, then we can forget it. Uh, but if it is, then it, 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 it should be more clear what it is about. Well, I think, uh, you know, at the time of the integration, but also since, Hungarians observed and appreciated the parts of the European Union where there is a transfer of money, which is the agricultural policy and the cohesion policy. And um, I have to say with regret that in the recent years we saw uh, a fall in the quality of the absorption, what concerns the regional money, a lot of examples for abuse. Uh, a lot of cases investigated by OLAF, which is uh, the appropriate agency of uh, the European Union. I think Hungarians also increasingly appreciated the possibility of free movement. Mm. Until 2011, we had the transitional arrangements with the most relevant countries, Austria and Germany. Um, the UK was open before, but a bit more distant from Hungary. But since 11, for various reasons, very high numbers of Hungarians went to work to other countries and this makes the EU popular because people realize that it's not only that you earn more but also the working conditions, the social rights are at higher standards uh, than um, at home. So a lot of people when they return they want to promote the development of wages, working conditions, social rights at home and I think this is a very good impact. Uh, 
in the future? Well, I mean, uh, the Visegrad Alliance originally, you know, 25 years ago, was formed to promote European integration um, and to prevent a black backsliding mm. towards uh, the East and the Eastern standards. Well, it has changed a lot, especially in the last few years, when in Poland and Hungary we have a problematic uh, uh, government. I would say that this group is not as homogeneous as, some, as, as sometimes it seems, because at this moment, uh, uh, at least the Czech Republic and the Slovakia, they are uh, governed by uh, social democratic prime ministers, um, one in coalition uh, in, in the Czechs. So uh, it's, it's, it's also a bit of diverse. Nevertheless, um, uh, they represent a common view, um, which is, in a way, insistence on the status quo um, in terms of the arrangement of competencies mm -hmm. in the EU, right? And uh, that we join this EU, and then these governments often say, whether it is social democratic or conservative, that we don't want the EU to take more uh, compensate. In the area of migration, which is a big clash between some of these governments and the EU institutions, um, the argument is not so much about xenophobia. I'm, I'm sure there is an element of that too. But uh, the argument is that we don't want the EU to take over the competence where it has been with the member state. I think in some issues it's almost inevitable. Mm. Because the times have changed, the, the environment has changed, the European neighborhood has changed, um, it's, it's almost inevitable that there would be more coordination mm. by the European Union, and I think the fair balance between coordination and uh, solidarity, risk sharing, border control, needs to be developed, and I think these countries may come on board.